Hey, I'm Zach. Welcome to the Ranger Cabin. In episode five, we learned a little about intergenerational trauma. Today, we'll continue our learning about its repercussions in Canada. Between 1960 and 1990, over 11,000 Indigenous children in Canada were taken from their natural families and placed into foster care or adopted in a social welfare initiative dubbed the 60s Scoop. My next guest, Nanikawasis George Littlechild, a prolific Indigenous artist, is one of those children. Today at 63, Nanikawasis courageously shares his powerful life story with us. The 60s scoop is well documented and there is a growing amount of information online about it. This discussion will bring that information to life. In this episode, Nanikawasis tells us about his early days in foster care, finding art, discovering his history and culture, and reconnecting with his siblings after being separated from them as a baby and hidden from his parents and extended family by the government. Recently, George has lost five different family members to COVID-19, all living in different places around BC and Alberta. Indigenous peoples in Canada remain incredibly vulnerable. There's a lot to unpack here, so grab a mask, get vaccinated, and keep our fire hot with my friend Nika Wasis, George Littlechild, Blood Memory, and the 60s Scoop. It's good to have you here. I'm Zach White, and this is the Ranger Cabin. How's it going? How's, how's this pandemic treating you? Well, you, <laughs> funny you would ask. It's just so many layers, just layers upon layers, and it just seems to get more complex. I, I think, you know, in the First Nations teaching um, with the medicine wheel, especially in the Plains cultures, um, I'm Cree, Plains Cree originally from Alberta, lived on the West Coast now 30 years, and here in the Comox Valley now almost, well, going on 20 so, um, you know, in hindsight, you know, like with a medicine wheel, you think mind, body, spirit, and emotions. When, when I hear on TV the non-First Nations world saying mind, body, spirit, well, that's all great. But in the, in the, the First Nations teachings, it's mind, body, spirit, and emotions. So when you have all those quadrants of the wheel intact, you are in balance. So if you're doing mind, body, spirit, that's great, but you're not dealing with your emotion. And a lot of people are taught that, as we know, as children. And, and so with that in mind, um, so dealing with those four quadrants, and then they break it up even further in the medicine wheel, the teachings. And, and so for me, it's sort of like, trying to address all that. What emotionally is this doing to us? How is our mind being affected by it? Well, we all know that the extremes of the pandemic and and how it has created a lot of fear. Um, Fear around life, death, losing people. I've lost so far my 87-year-old favorite uncle, my uncle Rainy Little Child died of COVID. Very hard on the family. His wife had it, and she's 87. She lived. And I've had several relatives who've had, I've had a first cousin who died, Alan, a little child, and he died of COVID at 67. I have another cousin who died uh, in his 40s. He was an Omuso, and uh, he's my second cousin. I have another second cousin, Conrad, who was in his 40s, also died. These are all First Nations Cree people. And I had my mother's first cousin die of COVID. So I've had lots, and I've had a lot of family members who've had COVID. Um, and as First Nations, Inuit and Métis, we are more um, prone because of the history since the colonization started and the arrival of the settlers. And um, I guess, you know, we've carried so much over the generations of history. Um, You look at the uh, impact of the reserve system. Imagine your freedom being stripped, taken. Could you imagine coming home and somebody takes you and your family out of your house? It's unimaginable. And puts you in this area with a fence around it Police, how is this not, it's a prison. 
It was a prison. Yeah. And it started a destruction of my ancestors' lives. My great-great-grandparents were born in freedom. After that, in their lifetime, were forced to live on a reserve. So that's not that far back. Mm -hmm. But since then, the intergenerational trauma that has occurred is deep and dark and vast and horrid. As a First Nations people, you know, Inuit too, and some Métis, well, Métis as well, they really paid the price um, in a different way. But I feel that as First Nations people, the trauma, the intergenerational trauma. So I, you know, and let's put it back to the other population. So the Irish, what happened to the Irish, right? Almost starved out by the British. Well, they carry that in their DNA. It's passed on to their descendants. Okay, there you go. So that's in your DNA. Yeah. And you carry some of that. And and all that happened. Um, You look at what happened in the Holocaust, who were they destroying? The degenerates, according to Hitler. So, you know, it's, and I've heard this said, and, and there's truth to it, I believe. And, you know, like sometimes research is research. I do a lot of research, but as an artist, especially, um, they say that Hitler modeled the concentration camps um, after the reserve system in North America. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's true or not, but maybe mm-hmm. it is true. I actually have read uh read some information about that and and also the in south africa apartheid apartheid was was greatly influenced by the canadian reservation system so so just getting back to that you have you have to realize that here you've got so people for us to basically give up their livelihood hunting buffalo hunting wildlife living free on the plane and it wasn't a total idyllic life you know you can't romanticize these things you know you look at the old paintings um you know the europeans when they they arrived here and then some of these artists like bodner and um others and and seeing this noble life you right. know roaming the prairies hunting gathering well there's a lot of strife in there there was a lot of warfare there was a lot of things that happened there was enslavement upon another tribe from another tribe it wasn't this idyllic perfect world however in hindsight and looking back once again the teachings the cultural teachings were so pure i mean my great great grandmother could understand what her dog said laugh as you will but this is truth. I know it. I'm a very spiritual person. And I believe, you know, once you believe how connected you are to the land, to the water, to the trees, to everything, the, to your cat and dog, to your furniture, everything, <laughs> this floor came from a tree. So how is it not living? That's right. Right? Everything is alive. We, if, if, if we were able to see the molecules and the cells and how, you know, how these movements from yourself to another person, and that's just it with COVID. Who knew that we were spitting on each other like crazy? I know. Isn't that nuts? Yes. Like I, who, haven't, I haven't had a cold since COVID I know, started. Because, because and, it's, <laughs> and it's because we're all distanced. And, and masks. And masks, and it's amazing. And, and they say the flu rates are way down. So getting back to the reserve system, so the layers, right? Um, So just so you know, in Canada, it's called reserve. In the United States, it's called reservation. Right, okay. So I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Yeah, it's all these things. Just like the Métis, right? There's the big M and the little M. Mm. So the big M are the Red River Métis, the true Métis. And then the government implemented any mixed race as a Métis, right? If they weren't from a reserve or status. So it wasn't just the French. It was the Scottish, the French, the English, right? And and perhaps other nationalities. I'm not sure. Sure. But it was priority them. So there's the small M Métis. So all these categorizations, you know, with the government. You know, so as a Cree person, I'm Nehiao, Nehiao. Right? So then you become Aboriginal, according to government, right? Then First Nations, right? And now they want us to be Indigenous. <laughs> so I think you just get up on that stand and say, I'm, for me, I'd say Nehiao, right? Uh, <laughs> Aboriginal, 
First Nations, Indigenous. How do you like me so far? <laughs> right? What do you want to call me today? Yeah, what do you want to call me today? Um, you know, and so that's the government. Why? Who decides these things in the government? Is There's always a little panel and making a discussion, making those decisions for everyone. So I always laugh at all the new names. <laughs> okay, now we're Indigenous. It, it must be to do with funding. Like, it, it, there's no other reason, is there? Or statistics gathering of, like, for healthcare. But it, which all ties back into funding. Right. You know, like I, I can't think of any other reason of like all these classifications and uh, labels that we're putting on and having to define people. And like, it's so, it's, it's exhausting. Well, here's the deal. Schools get funding for every Aboriginal child, right? That's right. And... They want I, Aboriginal kids. They do. And did you know I've heard, and these are just stories, okay? I'm not getting, there's nothing that, but I, there's got to be truth in here because I've heard it more than once, where the school uses all the Aboriginal money, not on the Aboriginal First Nations Inuit and Métis child. They use it to buy books for their library that aren't necessarily First Nations content. This is wrong. Because, you know, these schools that have a huge Aboriginal student body are getting a lot of money from the government of Canada. Interesting that it would get focused or just put into the pool as opposed it to streamed into an Indigenous program. <laughs> it does. And, okay. and, you know, there's other schools that are wonderful and great. You know, that do the work, that provide the education for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children. Um, and, and wonderful that they do that. I, for many years, as an artist, have done workshops in schools, uh, art, very serious art workshops. Which been great. I had the privilege of, of teaching in Inuvik, um, South Dakota, California, all over Alberta, um, BC, and different parts. Um, I had the great privilege working with the author Richard Van Camp. I illustrated two kids' books for him, What's the Most Beautiful Thing You Know About Horses, and A Man Called raven and he's like my brother and, and you know we've been on 10 tours together oh, wow. it's not just like you know you go spend the day with this guy we're a week at a time sleeping in hotels tr- right. and and we he's he's a great guy i love his writing i love what he does he's a real positive role model for first nations and you and Métis people so you know some of those tours but at, at 60 i i retired from it because you were visiting schools and bookstores and things oh, like that yeah. or is so that we, okay yeah like so Doing i did one, one amazing tour when i my i wrote i've written a couple of books and my one book this land is my land is a children's book it's very political and they did this tour which was amazing which started in vancouver seattle Portland, ah. um, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Oh, wow. And I, my book made a, the, the entire page of the LA Times. No kidding. With my art and writing. And, and in the New York Times, I had half a page. And that was phenomenal. But you see, that's the American publishers. If you go, and so that tour was so cool. I, uh, <laughs> my relative said on the reserve, so where am I from? So my mother, um, Plains Cree, from what was called uh, Hobima, Alberta. And the reserve she's from is Ermanskin. And now it's gone to the traditional name, was, which is Musquachis, which means bear. Like there was grizzly bears on the plains at one time. Right. They're ex- extinct. So it means bear hills. So where the bear is, there's little hills there. So that's, that was a traditional original name. And then when the different um, CPR uh, came with the trains, they would name all these stations. And so someone from the CPR loved this Dutch artist, Habama, and so it became Hobima. Which always sounded so First Nations. Didn't realize that but it was it's even. Not at it's all. a Dutch name <laughs> for this this Dutch artist right. from Holland who painted the landscapes. And the name of that train station on the reserve was given the name Hobima. Okay. So now it's called Muskogee's. Anyway, that is where she's from. And I, I talked about the ancestors, how they were forced to live on the reserve. So you look at the generational situation. So here you lose your freedom. I have a great story from one of my relatives. And uh, my great-grandfather, Alexander Littlechild, was the interpreter for the Indian agent sent by the government of Canada. 
So he would interpret, 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 hello, (laughs) Cree to English, English to Cree. And so his wife, um, Jenny Cardinal. So if you're a Cardinal, First Nations person, I'm probably blood related to you. Um, So anyway, the Indian agent came to their house. And by this time, they were living in little structures, houses, no longer living nomadically because they were forced, they couldn't live that way. So they didn't live in teepees anymore. They were living in actual houses. And so the Indian agent brought over this case of uh, blue willow china, which in those days was this, like to get china was expensive, but he wanted to honor. But just trying to transport china. Well, yeah. So it came in this big crate, right? And so the Indian agent had it brought over to their house and put it on their porch. And so this is a gift to you. Well, here's my great grandmother who wouldn't, you know, come on, dishes, like fancy dishes. It meant nothing to her. If any settler received this china, it was this huge expensive gift, but it didn't mean anything to them. You know, it hadn't, it didn't, what, they lived their nomadic life, they slept in the teepee, they didn't. So when the chairs and beds arrived, my ancestors didn't, they didn't sleep in the bed. Right. It's just too much to move. Well, if, especially if you're nomadic. Well, it is truly, but it was so foreign. Yeah. Can you imagine now you sleep on this bed, right? Um, now you sit at a table. You sit in a chair. Mm. When traditionally you sat on the ground, you slept on the ground, you you lived in your skin lodge, the teepees, hunted and trapped, all those things, and suddenly that's all gone. You're living in this this structure with the windows and a door. And walls. And walls, right, confinement. So I always think about that story of my great-grandmother. Interesting story about her. She was born Eugenie Cardinal in Lac La Biche, Alberta. And her first husband was Charles Goyen, and he was a Métis trapper, and he came from the United States. So anyone who's familiar with the Frog Lake Massacre in 1885 um, might know his name because he was one of the ones who was murdered at the Frog Lake Massacre, Mm -hmm. Charles Goyen. He was a carpenter. That's what he did. That's right. And so when he died, my great-grandmother was left a widow with their child, Daniel. And somehow, and we're not sure, but my great-grandfather, Alexander Nanikawasis, is his real name, not Little Child. And he was, he's from Saskatchewan because when I did research in the census records, he was born in Saskatchewan. So somehow they make a connection, him and her. And I'm not sure if he's part of Big Bear's people Um, are from a reserve around that area. So they relocate to Alberta and end up in Hobima, where they get married, and the child dies, and then they they have many other children together. So it's interesting to be part of that history, you know, that my great-grandmother's first husband died. So she would have been in the vicinity at the time of the Frog Lake Massacre. Wow. So, you know, I always... and, And so... Yeah, so as the story goes, so... How did he get the name Little Child? Thank you for asking. (laughs) So when I go to schools, I love telling the story. My cousin Marvin, Little Child, an elder, he told me the story um, of how he got his name. So Nanikawasis was a gifted hunter. And to be a gifted hunter was better than being a poor hunter. Sure. So when he went out hunting, he would bring back lots of game. But do you know who he fed first in the community? The elders. Yes. He fed the elders first. Who do you think he fed next? The The mothers. The mothers. And then who next? The kids. The children, orphans. Right? Right. So everybody would be fed before he would be fed. Right. A leader. A leader. And, And so he, you know, like he was known for his prowess as a hunter. Um, he was also gifted with horses, mm. and he helped survey the reserve that they were forced to live on, and um, he was known as a kind man, and I always think of him, and I've only got two pictures of him, they're not the greatest picture, but he was a real warrior, 
Mm. You know, and so what happened in 2001, I was asked by my relative Marvin Littlechild and his wife, Pat, to come back to the reserve for the Ermanskin powwow because they wanted to honor me for my art. And so I didn't know what was going to happen that day. I had no idea. So um, there's probably about 30 of my relatives who we all came in to the powwow grounds dancing together with the chief and uh, the orator. Um, Wilson Okimau, which means chief. Okimau means chief, leader, leader, boss, chief. He was the one that made the announcement in Cree, and then my relative Marvin said, just so, because I can't speak Cree, I'm not fluent, I speak a bit. Absis, I speak a bit of Cree. Um, I was then that he told me that today, you are now going to carry our great-grandfather's name. You will now be Nanikawasis. Wow. So I just think it's really apropos because, you know, in my art from time to time, I, I've painted horses for years um, in not knowing the connection. Oh, really? Yeah. That um, stuff always happens. Hey? It it's does. Like, it's all kismet. It's, 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 it's blood memory. Yeah. It's genetic. It, it's just really powerful. And, and so... Okay, so I'm going to leave that story and go to when I lived in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And my friend at the time, Ruth Cudhan, another First Nations artist, well-known, her late father, Stan Cudhan, told her to tell me this. Your friend has the spirit of the horse. The horses are the ones in the Cree culture that go to the spirit world, to the other world, and transcend to the artist information so it's like a conduit from the other world to this world through the horse so painting horses i had no idea why I painted horses mm-hmm. and people are probably wondering why that is so what i am is a product of the 60 scoop but i'll get to there in a minute yeah so let's get back to the history so you imagine the ancestors being forced to live on this reserve um, you know, their customs and culture was being tampered with. The things that they knew for thousands and thousands of years were suddenly the, at the brink of, de, of this, you know, it was almost lost. It was almost, I mean. Yeah. All the local knowledge is, is wiped out. A lot, a lot of it. A lot of knowledge is lost. Sure. I mean, here in BC, it's different because the white people came here a little later. Um, the European settlers, uh, word white. Anyway, um, so you have to imagine, so they're living this lifestyle that's all being tampered with, almost being destroyed. Uh, the sun dance, just like the potlatch, was banned. Yeah. Social gatherings, numbers were banned. Uh, they wanted to strip you of your culture, your language, your identity, but they didn't realize they couldn't capture your soul. However, the Christians and the missionaries tried very very hard it's only when you let someone take your soul then that's lost right but until then you still maintain that so anyway what the next thing that happened so living on reserve so if you want so zach if you wanted to go to the doctor you would have to go to the indian indian agent and you'd have to say to mr so-and-so it was never a woman it was always a man and who, were his, who do you think helped that Indian agent jurisdict over you? What group of individuals were sent by the Queen of England to dominate over the land? The RCMP. Mm. So hand in hand, so the government, the Indian agent, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and the next level is the priest in right. religion. So here you have... All that happening. So if you want to go to the doctor, you would actually have to go to the Indian agent and say, let's, let's say he's Mr. Beauregard. So Mr. Beauregard, I have to go to town to go to the doctor. Well, he would have to create this little note, permission note, that says, George, little child, or Zach, you will now be able to go to the doctor, but you need to be back you, this is your allotment of time. So he says you can go in between 3, but you have to be home before 6 p.m. Oh, good grief. Or whatever time. Yeah, for so sure. You, you would have to get to the next town by horse or horse and wow. buggy. Or maybe you were walking. 
And if you weren't back by a certain time, you were put in prison. So how, you know, so you start to strip people of their identity, their culture, their language. You start to erode that. Their dignity. You start to break their spirit, right? Absolutely. So you're hunting buffalo, you're hunting wild game. There was no overweight First Nations people. They ate healthy. They lived off the land. They worked hard for that food. They worked hard for that food. If you were lazy, you were looked upon poorly. If you did get overweight, you were really looked upon poorly. You ate so healthy and you lived this. I mean, so many people today want that life, like to be able to go back. Go back, but it's very hard to do so. Really think about that with the Inuit people, especially with climate change. Oh, good to go. Yes. All the all the all the animals. I mean, the plains experience this too with the extinction of buffalo and oh. uh, like all of the food sources being wiped out yeah. for fur or for meat, right? Well, and not even that. It was just just the the fact that this was we're going to take away their their livelihood, yes. their food source, and a lot of those buffaloes were just killed on mass and destroyed for no other purpose other than killing them yeah. to create this control. desperation yeah. and control. So you went from eating nomadically, you you had your food source, now you're eating government issued cows right and bread wheat sugar and flour all these white things came into their lives that they they never had there there was no flour like that sugar and and you just started to see that eroding the physicality of the individuals as well for sure um i have another story of another great grandfather antoine bruno and it was told to me that he actually the Indian agent on the Sharphead Indian Reserve in Alberta, which was close, not far from Hobima, that the Indian agent or whoever had ground glass and put it in the flower and, were, and was killing off the people of that band. And my great-grandfather was responsible for burying them. Wow. You know, like you, you think about these stories and, you know... Like it's you, not even real. Is like, it you just, just can't even write it. You can't even fathom that, that this this happened, that this happened in Canada. Yeah. Or the United States. Sure. Or in Australia. Or in New Zealand. Anywhere Indigenous people. Anywhere that didn't adopt uh, the United Nations Declaration of or Rights of Indigenous Peoples. They, they, you know, we were 10, late, 10 years late in adopting that. So was New Zealand, so was America, so was uh, Australia, I believe. It, Anywhere with uh, it, it, indigenous people. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly, because they didn't want to own up to the crime. Right. So oh. we're making advances in that now, but oh, holy moly, long time coming. Yeah, long, and so disorganized. So I'm really discovering that myself. Like, just we're moving there, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And, 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 and you are right. And, and, and it's going to take generations, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, 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 so the next step was, of course, the, the priests arrive um, on the reserve uh, in what was called Hobima. It was the Oblate Order. They were French Catholic order. And they set up, I believe, in around, well, 1890s, they set up their first residential school. First, the Methodists were there, and they had a school for a short time, which uh, dissipated. It was no longer. And then the Catholics took over. So you have to realize, so my great-great-grandparents, who were free nomadic, suddenly were forced to live on a reserve. And so I'm just trying to think here. So the next generation, so my great-great-grandparents... I'll just use one couple for an example. Uh, Louis Natchoasis and Betsy Sampson, my great-great-grandparents, had 14 children, and the youngest started going to residential school. Mm. So the older ones didn't. So it started to creep in to that generation. Mm. So then my great-grandmother, Peggy uh, Lewis, so she took the name Lewis of her father's first name. That family became Lewis's, not Natchoasis anymore. Right. So he took his first name. So Peggy Lewis married her cross-cousin, her first cousin, Chief Francis Bull. Um, so all of her children went to residential school. So that the next generation en masse 
were sent to residential school. Was the adoption of the name Lewis in part because of the church and the reservation? And the, and I the- wonder why that ha- it, it probably had a lot to do with the Indian agent. Okay. Um, you know, because, yeah, I really wonder. So you have to imagine there were no last names. Same, yeah, exactly. Same with Little Child. Like, yeah. we're getting to that, right? Like, yeah. where that came from. Yeah, so so he was Nanikawasis. So all his children would have their own First Nations name if it was traditional times. They would have had a number of names, right? So no longer, so you had to take the white man's way. So what do you do? So probably the Indian agent said, well, your children will use the name that we've given you, Lewis, as a first name, as a last name. Right. So they weren't they weren't Natuasis anymore, even though that would have been the way to, in my mind, would have gone the white man's way, not given the first name as the last name, but the Natuasis, which was his real name, which there was no Louis before. Yeah. They added Louis onto Natuasis. So it's all kind of complex and convoluted how these structures all occurred. And some people were given names, you know not related to who the, the First Nations name at all. So, you know, are they were mistranslated from the First Nations word into a whole different translation of that word. Um, and some people, you know, that happened in Alberta. BC was different. I can't really speak for BC. I've heard stories of how people got names here, though. Um, so anyway... Yeah, I was going to ask, like, in it, our names, multiple names would be given... Do you have seasonal names? Well, that I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. I, I just know, and I will we'll get to why I don't know as much as I should know. Perfect. I'll tell you that. So anyway, my grandmother and grandfather went to the residential school. Um, so what would happen traditionally is that your marriage would be planned, Zach. When you were born, you would they would set out and design who you would marry, and there'd be a reason you would marry this person. Right? right? And it was all a structure. Um, so in hierarchy, why my great-grandmother married her first cousin? It was her cross cousin. So a long time ago, if you came from maybe a noble family, and, and this whole word noble, but... I know what you mean. Yeah. High ranking. High ranking, whatever. You know, like... Good were, at hunting. Yeah, well, they had... They were the chief, or they were part of that lineage, and that did have honor. So... Here you would have a cousin, and um, so this is how it went. So if there was five siblings, so three daughters and two sons, the son's children could never marry. Never. But the daughter's children could marry their brother's children. So any of my mother's brother's daughters, I could call them Nichimus, which means sweetheart. Wow. And traditionally, a long time ago, planned marriages could have happened that I would marry one of them before the European settlers arrived and the priest arrived who started dominating who they would marry. Mm. Um, Alexander Nan- Nanikawasis and Jenny Cardinal's son, Edward Littlechild, who was my grandfather, and I've got these photographs of these people, and they're just stunning and be- just so handsome and beautiful. Long braids, you know, like, it's just, they're just amazing. He was a gifted athlete. He was an amazing runner. He was great at sports. He was built like a sports guy, you know, long tour. So I look at this, these, I've actually got about six or seven photos of him. I actually have a, a photograph of him, um, four First Nations fellows from Hobima at the time were part of the United Football Association's football team because they were that gifted. And the rest of the players were Caucasian. And in 1913, they won the tournament for the province. And I always think, that's so cool. (laughs) Like, there's a photo, and there's my grandpa, right? Edward, in the photo, and his brother-in-law, a couple other men. And, and, And so I think about how gifted he was. He went to the residential school, and then when he got out, somehow there were scouts that came, professional ball teams, looking for ball players on the reserve. 
And my grandfather was scouted for his, his, his ability as an athlete. And my grandmother and him were, it's an arranged, arranged marriage. And they had 12 children. And my grandmother, I think she, her heart gave out and she died at the end of the birth of 12 children. Um, I think she was about 36. So my grandfather couldn't just up and leave Right, his wife had passed away. He couldn't I was just twelve kids. My wife would kill me if well, I left with twelve. Well, kids. yeah, but you have to. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the deal: as soon as the kid was old enough to go to the residential school, the child was gone from the home. Wow! So you had these kids for the first couple of years, like maybe some kids ended up there when they were four years old for whatever reason. Um, so you probably had your kid for maybe five years, six years, maybe, and then off they went to residential school. If you didn't allow your child to go to the school, you were put in prison. That's right. So what happened to you and your wife is going to happen to your children. And when you think about that, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, like, I often wonder, why did she die so young? So you look at her, her so my grandmother's mother, um, Peggy, Peggy Bull, she lived to be 90. Her mother lived to be 104. How many kids did they have? Peggy had nine kids. Uh, Betsy had 14. Wow. You know, and they didn't die young. Yeah. And here's my grandmother, because they didn't go to the residential school and eat the crap. The, the, the food at the schools, as they say, was just horrendous. There was, you know, <laughs> bugs in the porridge. It was gross, disgusting, flavorless food. So getting back to the residential school, so my, most of my mother's siblings went there. Um, so the oldest would have been Helen. She went. Uh, the next would have been Alfred. He went. The next would have been uh, Mary Jane, she went. The next would have been um, Ross, who they called Francis, he went. The next would have been Louis, he went. So there's 12 kids. So there was my mother Rachel, Rosalie, they went. My uncle Rainey and Raymond went. Um, there was two girls that died when they were little. So there was 10 children. Oh, and Uncle William, and he was born simple. And so I don't think he went to the school. I'm not sure about that. Um, so anyway, so out of 12 children, so let's do the math. George never been my strong point. Nine kids went. Okay. So they all went to the school. Their lives were changed. They would have been treated as laborers. So my uncle tells me that in the morning they would get up very early and pray on their knees in the chapel, which seemed like hours. They would be fed this horrendous food. It was all orders. It was, and, and so when you arrived at the school, my aunt, I have one aunt alive, my, my mother's brother who just passed away of COVID, his wife's still alive. And so Auntie Rachel, lovely woman, she told me a story that when they arrived at the residential school, there was a thick roll of ribbon. So when you arrived there, you were given, your hair was cut, you were deloused, right? Head shaved, haircut, uniform, uniform given. Your name, Susan, is no longer Susan. You're now number 48. Oh, numbers. Does, numbers. So does this not sound like mm -hmm. prison camps in Europe? Definitely dehumanizing. Totally dehumanizing. So you're no longer who you were by name, that your, your parents gave you a name. So what would happen, let's say number 48 arrives, there's this roll of ribbon, you would write in this grease wax pencil, your number 48, you would um, sew that into your shirt, you would sew that into your pants, your socks, your shoes, your hat, your coat, if you were a girl, into your, the, the girl's attire. So if you lost your hat over there in the corner, Somebody would find it and go, oh, number 48. Number 48, come and get your hat. We found your hat, number 48. And if you can imagine this, do you, do you, do you humiliate, do, how humiliating for the, these children 
to suddenly know their name and suddenly, and so, you know, a lot of these children arrived there at five and six. You, when it ended, you were 16. Yeah. And the only reason you got out of there is if you're extremely sick or there was a reason, there had to be a really good reason that you were taken out of there because they didn't want you to go. They were trying to make you into a, like the European settler. They want to strip you of your culture, your language, your identity, your dignity. Everything was stripped away because then you would be subservient to become like the white man. It's a uh, assimilation. Assimilation. And, and from their perspective, they were doing the right thing. They were, they were teaching about, about Jesus and God and about spirituality of, of, of their choosing, of, of what they chose in life, and, and, and saying that this was the right way and your pagan savage ways are the wrong way. I'm going to strip you of that. I'm going to strip you of your language, your culture, your identity. And, and so you imagine this is going on and this is happening. Um, so I had two uncles that died at the residential school, Alfred and Louis. And I didn't know about them. Um, they weren't spoken about. And I'm, when my mother, gra- I can't even call it graduate, when she timed out at age 16, you know, they had, there's a picture of her graduation. <laughs> and I, I have literally hundreds of old photographs that I've researched over the years from different archives in, in Canada, all over Canada. I actually bought a photograph of one of my ancestors from a man in New York of Chief uh, Bobtail, and I paid 600 American for it. So, I mean, I'm an avid researcher. You're committed. Yeah, I'm committed. So my late Uncle Alfred and my late Uncle Louis died, and so my late auntie... Rosalie, you know, she told me she had an uncle that died at the residential school. Alfred didn't get brought up. I never heard about him until later. And she said his name was Louie. And she said he was a good-looking guy and he was very artistic. But he died at 11 at the school. So I managed to find photographs of these two uncles that died at the residential school. So here's my mother graduating from this institution. I managed to meet some of the nuns that taught her. When I met the nun, I'd say to, I said to Sister Alphonse, one of the teachers, what was my mother like? And she said, she's it's very pretty. Anyone who knew about her would always say she's very pretty. That was the first thing that they say about her. And she said she was very soft-spoken. Um, she liked to dance, and she loved to sew, because that's one of the things they would have taught her at the school. So getting back to that idea, so my uncle, after praying for hours in the chapel, they would be sent out into the field to work. They would be working, taking care of the livestock. So their education was very small. Their workforce was huge. They were out there doing all the work, all the chores, these boys. And the girls, they would be sewing. They would be cooking, cleaning. Um, My aunt, who's still alive, Auntie Rachel, she remembers ironing. So when the... (laughs) You have to imagine these, these, these women in these long black robes. And I don't know how you would describe it. It's the white part where is that wraps around her face. Yeah, I don't know the name for there's it. There's a name for Everybody it. knows what it is, yeah. I think. And I think there's another white part on the uniform. So my aunt remembers ironing the white part uh-huh. of this nun's uniform. And they would, I guess, starch. So for it was sure. stiff, right? Yeah. And she, she remembers, I don't know if she went into the room to get the nun's habit or how it happened, but she remembers seeing the nun without her habit on, and she was bald. And she screamed because, you know, you've never seen this individual ever except in this crazy habit. And suddenly she sees her without the habit on. How shocking that would have been. I've heard children talk about how poor the food was. I mean, adults, while they were children there at the schools while the priests and the nuns would have these gourmet, beautiful meals Mm. that the kids would know about or help prepare those meals Mm. for the priests and nuns, while the children were basically being starved. 
you know, and, and then, and then the, the layers of the sexual abuse or abuse, I have no idea what happened to my mother, and this is why. So my mother left the residential school, and she stayed around the reserve for a while. And by that point, you could now leave the reserve. It wasn't like in the beginning where you were forced to live on the reserve, that you were jurisdicted like a prison no longer. By the time she graduated, that had changed. However, at the residential schools, they had barbed wire electric fences. So if you escaped and you got to the fence, you would have been shocked, right? And you hear about children, I, you know, I don't know of any that escaped from um, Hobima, and I don't know those stories, but I'm sure there were children that tried. Or we hear about stories where children ran away in the dead of winter and froze to death, oh. or they went back to their family member who brought them back because they believed they were doing the right thing by bringing the child back. Or they had to, or they to had prevent to. getting arrested. Yeah, they couldn't, where were they going to hide them? Because they would have been arrested, you are right. And, and so here's my mother, so here's this shy, soft-spoken woman, pretty. Um, and so she ends up going to Edmonton with her sister, and um, she loved dancing. So I guess part of the attraction to the nightlife right, was the dancing. And in those days, they had ballrooms, right? Not like a discotheque. <laughs> this was a ballroom where they had fancy dancing, right? And that probably was part of her attraction to that area. Um, she met her first husband, who turned out to be Métis, and together they had a child, my brother. And um, he died very suddenly one day at work for, I don't... I don't know how he died, but he died as a young man. And so she was a residential school survivor, and uh, her coping skills weren't that strong. And she ended up in a mental institute in the Edmonton area, in Alberta, Canada. And in, in doing so, she did get through it with time, and then she would met my father, and, um, who was Caucasian. So I had no idea I was half white till I was 17 years old. Oh, wow. I had no idea I was half white. I, I was the Indian foster boy. Sure. Right? And so suddenly my mother meets my father, and he had uh, served in World War II. So I guess, is it post-traumatic stress disorder? Or yes. Is there a new... PTSD. But there's something new added. Um. Spectrum disorder. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So he would have suffered from that, but unbeknownst to the people of that era, they didn't diagnose people with that. They didn't really know what to do with them. Um, so his he was a cook in the army, but he also served. And so he came back with terrible nightmares. Um, so my cousin remembers when he came back home to Alberta, and they lived in Hannah, Alberta, and they lived on the farm that the nightmares were so bad that he slept in the barn because he would wake up screaming from his nightmares. And so he carried that. So you have to imagine post-traumatic stress syndrome or disorder. My mother was a residential school survivor. I have no idea what happened to her there. I'll never know. Lots of trauma, I'm sure. Lots of trauma. And so, you know, they, they say that often we attract, you know, we attract a partner that will help work out our own shit through, right? Sure. And, 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 and so there they were, these two individuals with scars and pain. And my father almost, he also came from a family of divorce. And so in that area, that era that was just not, didn't happen often. So these two individuals, survivors, um, came together and created a family of four children. Now, you're looking at generations. So my great-great-grandparents forced to live on the reserve. My great-grandparents and my grandparents' residential school survivors. So my grandfather died. So his wife died young, giving birth to children. She had a heart issue. So he didn't live to be very old. I think he was 49 or 50-something, 50 53 maybe. Yeah. So And his parents lived to be old. Um, and then you get my mother. So my mother and father lived on what was called Skid Row in Edmonton, Alberta. So the government, <laughs> once the residential school survivor 
timed out or graduated and started their lives. A new part of uh, Canada's historical atrocity towards First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people began, where they created something called the 60s Scoop. And what that meant is that they would actually gather children from First Nations families, Inuit and Métis, and basically in lots of cases they would just show up and take your children away from you for no reason. There was no reason to take the child away. They just arrived and took your children for no reason. However, in my parents' situation, there was a lot of alcoholism, a lot of uh, abuse, and so when I became a foster child, I was a baby, and then I kept going back and forth. I think I lived with them for about a year, my mother and father. And then... And you said they were on Skid Row. Was that yes. at that time? It was. Okay. So my first house is on 97th Street. I went, it's on my birth certificate. Oh, wow. Uh, my live birth certificate says the address that we lived at. So, oh, great. My life in so many ways, it's very interesting, very supernatural sometimes. So anyway, was it last? No, two summers ago before COVID. So I'm back in Edmonton. I try to get there about three times a year before COVID. I haven't been back home since COVID began. Right. And so my cousin, Priscilla, who's also a 60s scoop survivor, her mother also lost her children when they were, we were all scooped, 13. I forget how many of us were scooped up. My grandparents had 52 ch- grandchildren. And so there's about 13 of us scooped up. Wow. Around that number. So anyway, two summers ago, my good friend Derek Sorochan in Edmonton, I've known him for years. I met him in 1988 through my sister, who was his friend first, and another artist who works for the government now to make a living, right? Some artists don't always choose the, the battle, right? <laughs> how many artists, how many of you out there would actually <laughs> not get a paycheck for every two weeks? I've done this over 30 years, and I don't get a paycheck every two weeks. It's been tough times, man. The there's, struggle's real, man. It's real. <laughs> yeah. And there's been great things and great times. Yeah. So, so here's the deal. So <laughs> two years ago, I'm in Edmonton, and I say to Derek and my cousin Priscilla, because she was also raised in Skid Row in Edmonton, too, partly. And so I said, hey, I want to go to the house, the first house that I lived in when I was uh, a baby. And I had gone to it a couple years before. So on Facebook, I posted this house, and I said this was the first home I ever lived in, in Edmonton, Alberta, on 97th Street, Skid Row. And a guy that I went to art school with the Nova Scotia, at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, where I got my degree, chimes in. And he says, hey, I own that house. I'm like, What? No way. You own it? Yeah, I own it. It's a rooming house. I own it. So when I went to Edmonton, I arranged with him that I would go to the house and meet him, and he would give me a tour. So I bring my friend Derek and my cousin Priscilla, my first cousin, with me, because I knew where the house was, and I had driven by it before, a couple years before. So here's this old friend of mine, Chris Gozen. So there's Chris. I haven't seen him since I went to art school with him. And he's got the keys. We go in the building. It's still a rooming house. It's crazy. So he says, I've got a couple suites that you can see inside because no one's living there right now. We get to this room, right? And it's got a little living space, probably a room for a couch and a bed, and a little kitchen area. And your bathroom was shared down the hall. So the three, four of us are standing in this room and all of a sudden the light switch goes on and off. I'm like, what? And he looks, I look, and he plays with the switch. It's working, goes off. It's working, goes off. Well, what's going on here? So (laughs) we go to this bathroom and there's this beautiful old bathtub, the the clawed tubs, you know, the old beautiful tubs. Still there. It's all original. And I'm thinking, my parents could have had a bath in here. I could have been bathed in that bathtub. You know, it's all crazy stuff. Light goes on and off again. (laughs) And so (laughs) we're there and we have our visit. Then we go out for Chris. We take him out for lunch. So what I've learned is that spirit often travels through electricity. 
And my cousin says, we, we all talked about her. Like, why did that happen? She says, I'm sure your parents were there through, through spirit, in spirit. Wow. And giving you a sign in that room, in that house acknowledging that you were there. And I was just so blessed. And this happened another time to me. I've had a lot of little stories like this. Did you sit in that, in the room for a while? Well, was, you know, it's kind of or odd. Did you too, just kind of check it out? Uh, we, you know, when, when you're with a group. Uh, Super awkward. It's awkward. Like, can I just have 10 minutes so I can just lay on the floor in this space? I, I couldn't do that. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the, I'm actually a very kind individual. And I always think about others. Yeah. And, and I, I just, I guess I didn't want, and I don't know if I would want to do that alone, especially after the light switch kept going on and off. Um, not that I was scared of it, but, you know, so anyway, how was that? <laughs> you were scared. I would have been scared. I could see it on your face. I'd be like, man, I'm going to get teleported right now. You know, like what's going to happen next? Um, <laughs> so this is the crazy deal. I have my, so I have the only pictures of me from the age of zero to five are these pictures with my parents. I'm four months old. I'm not sure if we're living in that house or moved, but I was wondering maybe it was that house that those pictures of me were taken, but I'll never know. Was there like 10 rooms, 10 suites or something like that? Yeah, or? like it was actually quite a long, it still exists. It's, it, yeah. it's well built. So you went down this hallway and on each side of the, the uh, hallway were doors. And there was probably about eight doors on that side and eight doors on that side. So they're all rooms. And then upstairs, it's the same deal. Right. Right. So there's okay. two floors. Like a dorm. Yeah. So this, this guy that I went to art school with runs that and he's the landlord. So, like, how how is that possible? Oh, it's so s- weird circumstance. But I've got a lot of stories like that. I can give you a few more that are really... Okay. You know, little meant-to-be moments that happen like that. I think I'm not a religious person. I'm definitely a spiritual person. And I think um, anytime I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, things just happen in a way that is really easy. Right? And so it sounds like you're experiencing something like that like you're supposed to be doing these things and it's like of course your friend owns that building it's just all laid out in front of you in an easy way and you know i always say like i'm the luckiest guy alive i post that on my facebook you know i really feel that when you are on an energy flow everything is easy and everything just comes and people present you opportunities that you're like oh of course of course i'm gonna go do that or of course i'm going to talk to you today or and uh, you know uh the other day you recommended that i speak with harlem pruden who uh i will i wanted to learn about two spirit peoples and you were like you should talk to this guy he's like the most knowledgeable person in the country probably harlem called me like within a day and we had a long conversation and i just thought wow like what so there you go. Like yeah. there's just, and so now I'm talking to probably the most r- well-read person on the topic in the country within a day. These are these kinds of energies that we need to follow and need to hold on to and share and, and move with. Because I think really that is purposeful. And it sounds like for your own research and your own reclamation of your culture and of your history, it wants to be found. And, and you are so right. Um, when you are on the right plane, the right path, all the information is provided. So I, and often I say it's divine intervention. You are chosen. If you're living your truth, these things come, and they do. And, and I, I think the, the term easy also could be translated, it was meant to be in a deep, meaningful way. Why are we guided the way we are? You know, do you believe in spirit guides? Do you believe that your ancestors are around you? I'm asking you that. Yeah. Um, hmm. I talk to them sometimes, I guess. That's great. You I know, mean, it, there's, yeah, of course. It, I mean, my, my history is quite rich, and I think I've talked to, uh, I was talking to Wed Lady about it, but, you know, the name White, we were just talking about yeah. it because of Edmonton and White yeah, Avenue. White Avenue, which is amazing. So White with a Y. Um, you know, my history comes from Scotland and Ireland and Viking, like I'm a 
Viking blood, you know, mm-hmm. and that's where the Irish, I think, is uh, comes in. And I had a red beard, and oh, okay, uh, when I was young, and um, my cousins all have red hair, and <laughs> okay. yeah, very Celtic, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> But, you know, white comes from McGregor. So McGregor, oh, okay. McGregor clan is my tartan. Oh, okay. And uh, in 1630-something or other, uh, the king put a price on all McGregor's heads because we were stealing all the cows and we were causing trouble for the crown. Right. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, they put a price on anybody named McGregor could be killed. And so everybody just changed their names, but we wore the same tartan. Okay. So, so white was one of those names that they changed their name to. Now that was lifted in late 1700s, uh, but they just kept the last name. Okay. And so there's a few strands of us. There's some in Connecticut, apparently on the, on the East coast. And then there's uh, I've met another white family line in, in the Valley here. Went to school with them, Mike and Keita, and then my family, which came in 1888 from England, I guess on my father's side, and ran the coal mines. We were the, f- oh, were my you? great, great, great grandfather was the foreman at Cumberland. So he would have known the Dunsmuirs. Yes. Um, he was hired by the Dunsmuirs. Of course. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot of really cool history there to unpack. Mm-hmm. So that's why like White's Bay at Comox Lake was actually my great, great oh. grandfather had a cabin there. And oh, that was, so it was called White's oh, Bay because cool. he was the foreman of that <laughs> mine. And he was the son of James White. They're all named James, uh, James, uh, James White senior who came over. And so for me, a lot of the pursuit, even in this podcast and a lot of the, the, the work that I'm doing with indigenous peoples and cultural revitalization, language revitalization. I have so much genuine interest because it's the land. I feel really rooted here, even though I'm a, a latecomer at 1888. A lot of people would say, oh, wow, that's like really old, you know, like I'm sixth generation. My kids were born here now. They're seventh generation. But I feel like there's just more to understand as far as the land and, and the language and what that offers as far as understanding the land. And so I've been just so, so lucky. I, I don't know any other way to put it in that all the knowledge that I've sought after or to understand because I'm, I'm not necessarily interested in the history as much as I'm interested in what it means, like what the, what the spirit of the land is and what it is saying. Well, so when I hear you tell me about your, your history, I just think, well, it's Celtic. I mean, your ancestors before Christianity believed in little people and leprechauns. You believed sure. in spirituality, yeah. believed in all those Norse things. Norse mythologies. Or all those big. things that are connected to a lot of the beliefs of the first, first peoples here on this land. So, you know, like when I would do workshops in schools with kids, I'd say, you know, it wasn't that long ago. Some Your people believed in some of the similar things that we believe about the land here in Canada as First Nations people, as Indigenous people. And, you know, you can see their eyes kind of opening, you know, like they had never thought of that, never heard about that. But maybe once they start talking to them, and I say, ask your grandparents about your history. Where do you come from? Who were the people in your family? You know, and it really turns the lights on for so many children, for adults as well, who don't know that connection. So that probably plays a huge part in who you, for you as, a, as, a, as a human being. And yeah. it, it all goes back to that idea of divine intervention. When you're on the clear path and know your path and know what your purpose, the purpose of who you are and why you're brought to this planet, <laughs> there's so many amazing things that can come from that. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're guided, and I really believe that I'm guided, you're obviously guided as well because I, I've seen you in the community. I see you. It's like a bright light. You know, you, you don't have all this baggage, which is amazing because so many people well, have baggage. Well, let's not get too crazy. Okay, we won't get too crazy. <laughs> okay, I don't need to know all your baggage. But anyway, <laughs> but true, but I just see you as a bright light in the community. Mm. Um, so that's really positive. Yeah. You know, I spent a lot of my early years reconnecting. So I lived in Europe for a while and I've been to places in, in, and beaches in Europe where 
I felt attracted to a point where I was just like, oh, this is where I'm from. And that's a weird, so it's the same kind of gravity that you've been talking about in mm -hmm. that. And then it's like, I don't understand it, but I'm feeling it. And that's a real, that's, I mean, that's to me a real privilege to be able to feel grounded and know those. And even if it, historically it's not true, there is a reason. And so to have that experience so young, um, you know, something I learned about my family that's kind of interesting is a lot of them spoke Gaelic only. They didn't speak English. And my great great grandmother never learned English when she came, when she was here. She just spoke Gaelic. Really? Yeah. And right till the day she died. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a language I haven't dove, I, have, I haven't learned. Uh, I spent a lot of time learning Danish. So I've really dug mm -hmm. into that. And now I'm learning Kwakwala and again to, to understand where I'm from. And well, it's, it's like a secret code to the land here, right? It definitely you, cracks yeah. it open yeah, in a sure different way. Yeah. And, and trying to learn it in a way like, you know, as Wedlady says it does, it's learning learning language from the land yeah. as opposed to translating it from yeah. English. Right? Ex exactly. Which is very challenging in this day and age with a, with the language that is dying you know, it's almost gone away kind yeah. of thing. And, and it's, it's at the brink of... It really is. It really is at, at the end. It, it ha if not enough speakers are being taught at this point, you could die. That's right. There's about... I read some stats. There's about 700, a little over 700 people that have some knowledge some. of Kwakwala. But as far as fluent speakers, there's, you know, there was 60 but they're dying it's off. It's shrinking every day with the elders. Yeah. Once they pass away, the language is gone. Yeah. Um, there are great programs around that for revitalization. Um, so what you're doing really is important because with Truth and Reconciliation, you are a member partner. You're actually active within the community. You want to know about First Nations people. Uh, you're learning a language that is not yours. And, and to me, that says a huge amount about you as a person, but it also says a lot about you and your family the connections you have to this area, this territory, of, and of the Comox people. And, and so when I think about that truth and reconciliation, what is that? It's learning about First Nations, Inuit and Métis people in this country. Um, it, it's become a part of your mindset, your spirit, and, and, and in doing so, the ignorance is being shed, um, misunderstanding. You know, like often when I hear young people being very racist towards First Nations people, I often think, well, who's teaching you that? Your grandparent at the dining room table who was taught by their grandparents in ignorance and not understanding, not having enough information, not researching, not wondering. Like all these people in Canada, they're like residential schools and they didn't think, well, what's going on there? Like, wh why is that school? What's they just assumed it was a boarding school where kids were being taught. They had no idea the atrocities of what was going on behind that wall. Or they didn't really understand what the reserve was. Or if they did have a better understanding, they probably thought it was right. We're getting rid of the savages. We're, we're you know, we're, they're being decimated. If you think about the number of first peoples in what's North and South America, I only say 100 million, and the, I think the population of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people in Canada is 4% today, around that. Yeah, it's five, actually. It's five, it's gone up, thank yeah. God. Yeah, it's going. Um, it's good. Um, and so I'm going to get back to my story in a minute, but I just, you yeah. know, so, so with COVID though, the numbers, the, so I looked at an American stat, the highest um, as far as race is concerned, uh, Native Americans are the highest amount of people being affected by COVID. Oh, absolutely. It's the most vulnerable population Ex by almost double. Exactly. It's uh, absolutely, and I think, Part of that bubble is within the social system of Indigenous peoples. In my limited experience, really, and I've been fortunate to be kind of adopted in by a family, mm -hmm. it, it's so social. And everybody's always around and everybody's, you know, taking pies and cakes to the elders. And uh, it's that's a huge part of like how the system or just everyday life. It's about supporting each other and lifting each other up and the big house has been closed for so long and 
it's it's bru- I'm wearing a shirt right now that has smoke from the big house. Oh wow! And uh, <laughs> just because it makes me feel comfortable, oh. you know, like it makes me remember when I smell it yeah. that it's so important to our fabric. The things that I'm learning of this, the way this society is structured, there's so much value and so much benefit, and it's such a humanist approach to life. And this is why COVID strikes at the heart of it. And it really makes it vulnerable in the sense that, you you know, again, it's being, it's piercing into the way the system, like way that culture is set up and people don't have the resources. And we were talking about living in an idealistic bubble. I am, I've, you know, I spend a lot of my time with people who are extremely cultural. They're working very hard to decolonize. They are actively academically in pursuit of learning and studying and how were things done and talking to Wedlady and like getting mm-hmm. culture dump from him. And I'm surrounded in people who are so interested and so passionate about creating it that I forget that it's not everybody. You know, the people that I'm hanging out with are are really at the forefront of reclaiming culture and and moving it forward advancing it into the future and that to me is so exciting because i attract those people and those are the people that i'm attracted to Mm -hmm. my fear is though that i'm looking at it going why haven't you changed your name back to you know obviously little child you built equity in that as an artist but you know i'm talking to friends who are like hey i've been given this name you know, I may have this name for a few years or 20 years, then go by that name. Mm-hmm. That's your right to go by that name. And and that's just me, you know, I'm not trying to project or convert as I, you know, I've joked about in previous episodes. I'm not like, do what you want. But I forget the fear and the shame and the trauma and all of these things that may be attached to a name Mm -hmm. um, that by presenting yourself as an indigenous person first carries with it this massive burden and fear. Uh, And to me, I would think, oh, that's great. That's my privilege. I'm a six foot six white man, (laughs) cisgendered, educated loving parents, you know, raised and supported by a massive community. I'm the poster boy for privilege, you know? So acknowledging that every day for me is extremely important. And also when I'm interacting with people, understanding that my privilege is my bias as well in that, you know, well, why don't you do this? I mean, obviously, but I have this kind of, I forget it, especially when I'm dealing with people that are pushing hard and changing things. But I would love to encourage more people to use their first names or use their, use their indigenous names Mm -hmm. in everyday life and just have that courage because I've even, I'm like, I, I, I just call people by the, by their indigenous names, whether they want it or not like a jerk. No, that's not and a jerk. That's honoring their spirit. <laughs> I, ho- I hope it is. And that's my intention. Oh, it is the intention and it is true. And I, and I would hope to do that. And I see them light up as I do it because they're not used to that, you know, and a lot of people have names and they don't know how to pronounce them. I know. They or they don't know. They haven't spent, how do I, you know, I had a great conversation the other day with somebody who, was saying, oh, I've always been trying to embody the meaning of this name. How do I honor this name? How do I capture the spirit and wear this name in a way that my ancestors would be proud and the way that they've worn it? And everybody has brought their own spirit to this name. And, and then tapping into that, how would they have worn it? How would, mm-hmm. how would, what was their personality like that would have shaped this name and what it means and now it's been gifted to me and then and I'll hold it for a while and then I'll pass it down. You pass it down. When we were talking about the reservation system and sorry, I'll get back to the interview here in a minute. I'm totally <laughs> hijacking it. Um, when you're talking about the reservation system and the stripping of rights, if only the church had taken a minute 
to sit in the culture. When I sit in this culture, I just see something. It is vast. The world of like how it's structured and what everybody brings to it. It's not coming from a single source. It's coming from everybody that participates in it. And it comes up from that. That's how I see the culture. Everybody has a role to play and everybody brings something special or brings an embodiment of their name to the fire. And it's the opposite direction of Christianity. Christianity is kind of a top-down methodology. And I think if people understood it, especially as Canadians, and I really encourage everybody to take a moment and sit in the culture in a genuine, authentic way and learn. And what they'll find is there's something there for, there is a part for you to play. And there's something for you to be able to participate in and hold up. And um, even if that's holding up the people around you who are indigenous and encouraging them to embrace it, um, not forcing it on them, but just encouraging them if they're interested in it and supporting them in that. And maybe it is a small thing, like just calling them by their indigenous name. I've noticed massive changes in that. And I really am saddened mostly as a student of, you know, as an academic, I'm really saddened at the loss of the culture because it's so much more powerful. I'm seeing that now. And in learning about two spirit with Harlan and him presenting to me, uh, 130 different words for the word of two spirit person mm -hmm. across the country. And the understanding that some languages have over seven genders. So like he, her, and then five others. Mm -hmm. It built at hard baked into the language. That to me is a more understanding culture and a more understanding interpretation of what the world is giving us. Everybody belongs. It's not black and white. It's all gray. And it's almost like the languages and the cultures are the grayness. And that's human, right? We're not this or that. We're not a label. We're not maybe even a name. If this name doesn't fit me now, Maybe it's time for a new name and a new role, right? And I just, it's, there's so much treasure there. Mm -hmm. And it is so true. And, and so getting back to the idea of the name, receiving my great-grandfather's name, Nanikuasis, was a real honoring, a real gift. And, and it's true at some point, I will have to give it away and pass it on to somebody else in the family. Um, and I look at his strengths. He was kind, giving, sharing. He was a good worker. He was a warrior. And I want to be that. And I want to impart that through my art, my, my, pers my person, right, to be that strong individual when times are tough, that you will get through it, that you have this ancestor whose name you now carry and what he went through in his lifetime, and you can do that as well. And, and you can take that story perhaps further than even is. to say further than that would be not only will you get through hardship, you will lead others through it mm -hmm. to be the leader to live yeah. by example kind of thing. Yeah. So getting back to that house. <laughs> yeah. So bring <laughs> us story, back to yeah. the, so in doing that, it, it really imparted a, a strong message that my parents in some way are still connected to me. So what was the 60 scoop? So as I mentioned, some children were taken, right? Trucks or planes or whatever, a train mode of transportation to go to First Nations communities and strip children from their families and bring them to the big cities um, and being raised in white foster care are adopted and there was even advertisements in this the, the newspapers across canada and they would have a picture of the child and it would describe the, the child's name and jane likes to uh explore nature and jane likes to play with dolls and there would be her picture would you like to be jane's foster parent or would you like to <gasps> adopt jane it's true Wow. If you look at the archives across Canada, there was ads advertising children for people to take. 
So I became part of that system. There was a lot of dysfunction in my family, I get it. But what happened when the welfare intervened and started taking my different family members, my brother and I in the beginning, and as more children were born, and over the four, I became a permanent ward of the government when I was the age of four. And so over the years, there was five children, so they would take children, you know, as the children were born. As my siblings and I were being put into foster care and became became permanent wards of the government, only one of us was illegally adopted, my brother, one of my brothers. And so what had happened, why I'm part of the 60 Scoop, is they did not let my mother's siblings on the reserve um, have an option to raise us. So my uncle and aunt, my uncle who just passed away of COVID, he and his wife went to the city to ask where his sister's children were. And they told my aunt and uncle, the welfare department told them that we were, had been adopted out into the United States, which was a lie. And they wanted to break the, uh, just kind of let them know that you'll never find them, they're gone. But meanwhile, we were not far away from them at all. We we're all raised probably within 100 kilometers of the reserve. Oh my God. It was that close. And, and so when they heard that news, they just gave up. They never gave my mother's family on the reserve the option to raise us. And that's what the 60 Scoop did. So it broke connection, broke ties. And, and so um, my, I was in three foster homes that I don't remember. And the fourth foster home that I did go to, my brother and I were together. And I, he says I was there for about a year. And she beat me so badly. I have scars and dents on my head. To look at me, you would never know that this had happened. But he said, well, I remember in that home that after they ate, her and her husband and their two sons, we would eat, right? So, the, And there'd be a divider between them and, and the kitchen put up. Um, when everybody went away to school and the husband went to work, I was put in a basement, a cement basement, and she beat me, beat me badly. Um, and I, I have memories. I don't even know. Do I say this? She made me my own shit. She really? was, yeah, she beat me so bad. I remember scraping my underwear because I had crap myself from the beatings. And, you know, you think, here's the government who's trusting this lunatic to look after a small child who's an innocent child. Um, and, 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 and this is what she did to me. And, I, you know, I have this memory of her. It's her, the bot like this, her skirt and her legs yeah. is my memory of this woman. Because often I was sitting in the cement basement, curled up, and her coming down the stairs. So eventually, I, I don't know how many times she threw me down the staircase. And I think that's how come I've got these scars on my head. And how I know, because my brother, who was six years older, saw things new things um he said the last time he saw me my face was so black and blue and i was so beat up he said i can't believe you look the way you do you know when i found him as adults he says i couldn't i can't believe you look the way you do because of what i the last time i saw you he was living with you at this time. he was and she didn't touch him it's too big i guess he maybe fought back. And so the story that I was told is that a doctor was brought in and she claimed that I had urinated the bed and it was Edmonton, Alberta, 40 below in the winter, winter and the window was open and that's why it's black and blue. The doctor didn't, he said, this is not, this is not true. And he got me out of that home Ugh. after being there a whole year. But why my brother stayed on, why the welfare... Like why, you know, the, why would that woman ever be given the privilege of having of a raising kid? a child? Um, and so my fifth foster home, the one that I stayed in until I was an adult was with the Dutch Canadian family. And um, my mother right from the go get was this, 
she's a she was this amazing saint. She was one of these individuals. She saw someone poor and homeless, hungry. She would reach out. She 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 helped so many people. She helped uh, people in the hospital system that couldn't feed or feed themselves. She went every Thursday like a religion and had a whole group of people. A very special woman that she had met, and her name was Edna Steinhauer, and she was German background, um, and she. I think she was 18 years old and she developed polio or something and she ended up in the hospital and she was paralyzed from neck down. She could only speak with a slurred vision and she was blind because of the polio, I believe. <clears throat> and my mother became her voice. Edna would listen to the, the, all the news, right, on the radio or TV. And she would, my mother would write to all these people, like all these politicians, for, for Edna's views through my mom's hand, and she would mail the letters off to that politician, what Edna thought should change or what should be done. She would write the Edmonton Eskimo. She would write all her favorite team sports. And my, they would send footballs or they would come to the hospital to visit Edna, sign a football. Here's this woman laying in this, this bed, only functioning from here up, <laughs> right? And my mom was her voice. Uh -huh. um, she loved Hank Snow, so my mom would write to Hank Snow the singer and <laughs> Hank Snow would come and give her gifts and my mom was an advocate for those who couldn't speak. My mom helped she helped so many sick people and I think as a foster child it, you know the, you know being raised in an environment I was the only First Nations person in that environment okay. except for a few other Indian foster kids or First Nations foster kids I should say and I just saw that, you know, like sometimes <laughs> she would bring all these people home. Like this guy was in church. So they're all Dutch Canadian, but sometimes non-Dutch Canadian people would come to church there. And there was a man from Africa, and I remember her bringing him home. And, and, and so for me as the Indian foster boy, I, I often related myself to him. Right. right? Yeah. I, I kind of knew that I was, and it wasn't her or my foster father that did that. It was other people in the community. Um, my aunts and uncles in the Dutch foster home were great. They were loving. And I don't remember any of it, but it was the other Dutch people that was sort of like, the, put you in your place. You're that Indian foster kid. Right. So they would like, they, they taught me that I had no value. Right? It wasn't my mother that raised me. She built me up. And it was her that helped me survive through all the racist crap I experienced. It was her that say, just ignore them. She was so kind and loving, but she was also tough. She wasn't a weak woman. She was she was strong. She had she believed in helping those that couldn't help yourself mm -hmm. themselves. The only thing that sometimes I think, you know, like I asked her, I said, Well, Mom, why did you choose me? Like why did you choose me as a foster boy, your son? <clears throat> and I remember she told me that her and dad had gone with an aunt and an uncle, and they went to the receiving home to pick a child. And they had gone through, and I, I guess I had the mumps, so it's all swollen. And I don't know, <laughs> based on that. Yes, you know, yes, we have a winner. Yeah, we we pick this kid wow and and i guess i and 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 bless her soul because she was kind but she was very christian yeah um and and i i think you know like years later i brought up to it her. seemed to work out for you let's it did not, let's not <laughs> but but years later i brought up to her some of the stuff that i didn't think yeah. was right and she's and she was so kind and gracious she said you right. know if i had a chance to do it all over again i would I know wow. she knew, the, you know, so, and it, it, just in hindsight, just, you know, so, so mom, why did you choose me from all these kids? You could have chose any kid in that building. You chose me. And she, and I expected this answer, right? Oh, you're such a cute kid or something, something like that. Right. And, and, and there she says, well, we wanted to help someone less fortunate. Right. And, and we were Christians and we wanted to provide a home for a child. So you have to look at the era, the time, her religion. Yeah. She, you know, if she was to translate that and think about that, it probably wasn't the answer I wanted, but it was the best answer she could give me at the time. Yeah. And I know what time and, and how life changes and advancements are as humanity. Um, and then I did talk to her that one time as an adult, and she did say, you know, like, she apologized. And to me, that's the greatest gift of all,
when you can apologize for something, the wrongs, right? To make them right and give that person their dignity back. She saw what was going on with these other individuals, but she built me up. She made me strong. She was the one that saw when I was four years old, I was drawing. At four years old, uh, I was drawing. Yeah. And she noticed that I was drawing. It was her. She, she wasn't this kind of mother that said, oh, Zach's good at mechanics. He's going to be a me- mechanic. Oh, Zach's good at, oh, he's very bright. He should become a doctor. Wasn't like that. She saw your skill set and she made it happen. She nourished you. She, so she sent me to art classes as a small boy in Edmonton, Alberta. I went to this woman. Her name was Miss Ethel Field. And she was a teacher at the University of Alberta. Alberta. And when modern art came into the, the, the um, um, curriculum, she balked and she said, I'm out of here. So, and she was old, so she retired. She left it. It was just amazing. She lived in this beautiful old Victorian house. It was two stories. And I remember going up. Here's this 8, 9, 10, 11-year-old kid. I forget what age I was. And probably 11, 12. And I'm going up the staircase, right, from my first lesson. And it was 50 cents. That's what you paid. And you knock on the door. She'd come. And she was an old, older woman, right? She had a bit of makeup on. Her hair was always permed. And... You know, and you walk in this house, it was all this Victorian, you know, all the crown molding, beautiful doors, and everything was very dark in there, though. Yeah. But, but on houses. her walls were drawings and paintings of First Nations people and Inuit people, because that's what she liked to paint. Okay. So I thought, what the heck? And I'm looking around, there's all, <laughs> the, all these Indian faces staring back at me on her walls. <laughs> so did she do portraits similar she did. to you? No, not at all. She, okay. They were heavily realistic. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, you went down a staircase and it was this <laughs> cement basement, kind of small, weird room. And she'd have all these old ladies in there and they're all painting and oil. And <laughs> they were using, and she, she provided you with the, pastel, the pastels, the paper, the supplies, which was interesting because today nobody would give you that. Right. Um, and so you went back in this other room and I always had this smell, the linseed oil. I remember that to this day. Mm. And so you'd pick out all your supplies and go at your little area and, you know, she would get you to draw, like she'd create a still life and you would paint that. And it was because of her that I started to draw Indian children as a child. She was my influence. Like, how kismet is that? Yeah, that's That here I'm going to art classes with this elderly woman who's Caucasian who paints Indians. (laughs) Like, how was, you know, then there we go again. You know, like, why was I sent to her? Of all the people I could have gone to for art classes, I was sent to Ethel Field. Um, so here's a cute story. I, I always think, you know, so, so all the old ladies would leave, and then kids would show up, like me. And there was this boy in the class, and Gregory was his name. And I always laugh because Gregory was the best. Like, at it, art. Yeah. Like or just at He everything. could draw anything, and it was just amazing, right? right, right. Whereas the others, of, <laughs> the others in the class were learning and, and trying to implement what she was instructing you at. And, you know, and I often think, I wonder what happened to Gregory. <laughs> Because I became the artist. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe Gregory's this amazing artist out on the planet. If you're out there, Gregory. <laughs> yeah. If you're out there, Gregory. You know, so that was kind of the beginning. And then she was this one, like, as I got older, she would send me to art classes at the um, Edmonton uh, Art Gallery. Um, the school I went to was this Dutch Christian Reform private school. And, I mean, I went to church Twice on Sundays, I went to church boys group Wednesday. No, catechism okay. Wednesdays. I went to church boys group cadets. For I, everything I did was around religion and Christianity and the church. The school I went to was a Christian school. So so my whole life was revolved around the Dutch community. I was brought up Dutch-Canadian. Wow. Right? Yeah. And so, ik ben niet Hollands. I speak a little bit of Dutch, klein beetje, you know, but I was, that was my life, right? And, and, and I remember one time finding this letter in, in the letters in, in this beautiful wooden bureau, 
and I guess I was being nosy, but the letter stated something about, was from the welfare department, and I had no understanding of it. So as a foster child, when you had children and you went to travel, the child could not go with you to the United States or travel abroad. Yeah. So I read this letter and it sounded, it scared the hell out of me. And I remember being very scared by the fact that I might lose, um, I might be taken away from this foster home. Wow. Um, so there was always that fear, you know, I always say to kids that who were adopted, but you never knew that. Maybe you knew it in a different way, mm-hmm. but there was always a fear that you could be taken out of that home. Of course, you've been taken multiple times already. Yeah, I could be sent back to who, who could I end up with another crazy individual, like the one that I'd love to say her name. I know she passed away, the crazy one, but I won't say her name. Um, I know his name and her name and their last name. Um I could have ended up in another home like that. I could have been sexually abused. Yeah. So now the story gets a little deeper. So when I was 17 years old, I remember looking in the mirror and I was like, I had this weird, almost overwhelming feeling. Who am I? Right? All my life, you know, like I know I'm Indian, but I had no connection. I remember at, at the Christian school, I remember in grade nine, the teacher said, well, George, tell us a little bit more about Indians because we were doing social studies. <laughs> I was like drawing <laughs> a blank. What can I tell you? <laughs> There's nothing I can tell you. The only other First Nations people in my life that I ever saw were other Indian foster kids, that kids who were adopted into the Dutch community, or Skid Row and intoxicated First Nations people when you went to downtown Edmonton. Those are the only other people that who that were like me that I ever saw. So I was looking in the mirror and I had this overwhelming sensation. Like, did you identify then as white? Were you just like I'm I was just trying to fit go... in? No, I, I well, I would. I took my Dutch foster family's name. I used it for several sure. years. I legally changed it to their name. Oh, okay. Um, because I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be part of, of what was going on. Um, my fear is that, I, you know, and I, I still think I, I bear the scars of abandonment. Yeah, because absolutely. I, you know, so, and that's one thing that I work at, trying to get rid of, even as an elderly person. Um, but there was always that fear that I could be abandoned again, right? No matter what I did. Um, so getting back to the story. So at, so I was 17 years old having this huge dilemma of who am I? You know, like I didn't look like the Dutch community, community around me. Um, there was very few other people of color that I ever saw. And I had a huge identity crisis and I said to my mom, I said, mom, I'd like to know who I am. Is that okay? Can I find out who I am? And I was 17. I mean, legally at the age of 18, I'm no longer ward of the government. And she said, oh, no, that's fine. So she set up an appointment with the welfare department for me to go talk to somebody to find out who I was. So the date was set, set, and um, I went to that appointment. And I think it was a man that I spoke to. could have been a woman. It was so long ago, and I, I just sat down. And I said, well, I'm here because I want to know who I am. Who am I? Where do I come from? Who are my parents? Tell me about me. Tell me about myself. I had no idea who I was. And, well, he said, your name is George, of course. <laughs> and, you know, the story, and they said, and um, your father was James Price. He was a white man. I was like, a white man? I was oh, like, wow. What? What, a, what a vendor. I'm like, white man? What do you mean, white man? I'm half white? Totally took me for a huge surprise. I had no idea I had a white father, ever. In my life, I was the Indian. I was brought up as the Indian in a Dutch community. I, when I was a child, I looked very First Nation. If you saw me, you would not know that I was half white. As I get older, I take on some of my father's features. As I got older... And so they, this is how they describe my father, James Price. He was a, a tall, tall, good-looking white man who was very talkative. So they said, your mother is an Indian. And this is how they described her. She was a short, stout Indian with an attractive face, but wore too much makeup. And I'm like, <laughs> what? So they didn't tell me that they had both died. On Skid Row. Okay. They didn't tell me that at all. But what they did tell me next is that I had an older brother, a half-brother, 
Um, and he was no longer a foster child, so they couldn't help me find him. They said I had a sister who was a foster child, but she was a juvenile delinquent. And she ne- they said, she's bad news. I, I suggest you don't even look for her. She's bad news. Uh, you have a brother who was a year younger. So I was 17. So at the time, Marilyn would have been 16, the juvenile delinquent. Clark would have been 15. He was adopted in a Métis community, they said. And then Shirley, who was 13 at the time, was in a foster home. And so having, so they're stating my older brother, he's timed out, so they didn't have any information on him. Uh, my next sister, juvenile delinquent, the next sibling is adopted. But the youngest sister wants to meet her family. Would you like to meet her? And I said, certainly, I'd love to meet her. And so the date was set for me to meet, and it was in the summertime. Not sure whose birthday it was, because there's a picture of one of us blowing out a candle. She was born in July and I in August. And um, so here's an interesting fact. I was born August 16, 1958, the same year and day as Madonna. She arrived on the planet in the morning and I in the evening. (laughs) Crazy stuff. That's wicked. <laughs> it's so crazy. <laughs> 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 we ain't even going to laugh at that. <laughs> um, which is neat. I mean, who knew? Um, okay, so the date is set for me to meet my youngest sister, Shirley. And at the time, I didn't know for sure if I was gay or not. I was working at the Hudson's Bay in Edmonton as a stock boy. And um, so I'm 17, and I got to know the girl at the candy store because I've always loved sweets, one of my evils. And and I would go there to buy candy before I went to work or something, and she was very sweet. I think I asked her out on a date, and we were going to go to the movies. And so, okay, yeah, we met at the Capitol 6 in Edmonton on Jasper Avenue, and we met and we went to this movie. And I've never had a panic attack. I had no idea what that was, but I guess I had a panic attack. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the theater and I'm going, oh my God, what is wrong with me? My heart is racing and I'm out of my body, like I'm freaking out. And I've got this girl beside me. We're at a movie. Hold it together. You can't freak out. What's, how's she going to feel if you suddenly stand up and run out of the theater? You can't do it. Hang in there. The movie will end. What a horrible date for me. I mean, she didn't even know I was going. She had no idea I was going through that. (laughs) Anyway, I remember I had chapstick. And I remember going in my pocket and it rolled out of my, fell on the floor and rolled down the aisle. And it just was, the sound was personified. Amplified. Yeah, amplified. If you've had a panic attack, you get to relate to all these things I'm talking about. Totally. So anyway, the movie ends and I'm going, thank God it's over. (laughs) <laughs> so I remember getting out of the theater and bringing her around the corner right across from the McDonald Hotel and she caught her bus and off she went. And I was like, thank God, right? I couldn't tell her a damn thing. I had to look like we're on a date. I'm a good guy. I'm a nice person. Not this idiot freaking out in the movie theater having a panic attack. <laughs> Excuse me for calling myself an idiot. That's not nice. Anyway, <laughs> so I get back in front of the theater, right? And I'm 17 years old. And I've just learned all about my family, right? Obviously, I mentioned that. And so I'm waiting for my bus. And my bus is the number one Highlands. And I'm still in panic mode. And I'm standing in front of the Capital Six. So when I was there, just before I moved one block east, there was nobody there but me. And <clears throat> suddenly I noticed this, this thin girl, long dark hair, attractive. And so I'm here, and she's almost next to the door. So there's quite a distance between her and I. But I could see her features. And anytime anyone ever gave me a watch, they die. I can't wear watches. Oh. They always die. Wrist watches. I can use a phone. It doesn't do that. But wrist watches always died. Nobody um, gave George a watch. <laughs> ever. He will die. <laughs> so anyway, I'm like... What, like, it seemed like an hour had gone by since the girlfriend had caught the bus. It just seemed like forever. 
And so me being me and having the mom that I had, had she was so outgoing. I said, oh, I'll ask her what time it is. So I walked up to this young lady and she sort of stands back and it gives me this look. And I, I said, do you know what time it is right now? And she said, look around the corner. There's a clock there or something like that. I'm like, oh my goodness. You'd think I had... How did, like she was quite curt with me so we went around the corner <laughs> there's a big clock there and it's like 11 30 at night or something so i went back to where i was standing in the beginning and i just glanced at her just to, you know just to look at her one more time because she was quite rude <laughs> and I lo- as i'm looking at her my whole body went zzz, that it was like this whole my whole body went zzz, and all of a sudden, this man, a big man's voice, George, that's your sister. And I went, what? And I look at her again, and I said to this voice, I said, how oh, will I know that's my sister? And the voice says to me, ask her if she was abandoned as a child. And it went away. The sound went away. The voice went away. I'm like, oh, there's no way I'm going to ask this woman if she was abandoned as a child after her curt and rude response. She kind of talks to you like a sister. (laughs) Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) Yeah, really. (laughs) Typical. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) So I thought, you know what? A bus is going to come. She's going to get on it. Or my bus will come that I've waited, seemed like forever for. And one of us will go, and I will never know if this is my sister. Who gets a big, scary voice out of the sky telling me that's your sister? So I went up to her and I said, excuse me. (laughs) She looks at me like a very scared face. Were you abandoned as a child? And she looks at me and she said, yeah. How do you know that? Well, I think I'm your brother. And she looks at me, <laughs> and I look at her, and these, her eyes are, like, huge. I said, well, did you know you have brothers and sisters? I know I have one brother. I said, no, you have three brothers and one sister. You and just decide at this point, yes, you are, it is your sibling. And it, it turns out this is Marilyn. Wow. The juvenile delinquent. Yeah. The welfare told me never to meet. What? And so I'm. Look- and what is that, anyways? A juvenile delinquent, anyways. <laughs> well, like that is just so so crazy. Right? Labeled her, right? Ugh. And so I said, "Look, one of us is going to get on a bus. I need to know what. It, how can I talk to you again?" She said, "Well, I work at the Executive Hotel as a waitress downtown Edmonton. Come to my work." And I said, "Well, you know, tomorrow I'm meeting our other sister." Surely, for the very first time, do you want to meet her? She said, of course I do. So I don't know who got on their bus first. Somebody got on their bus, and then I got on my bus, finally went home. And the whole bus ride home, I was like, oh, my God, what just happened? So I'm like, I can't wait to tell my mom. So I get in the house, and I go down the long hallway to get to their bedroom, mom and dad. And I knock on the door, and mom goes, what, what? And I said, I open the door, mom, guess what happened to me? And she said, what? I said, do you remember that sister I was told never to meet by the welfare? Well, I met her, and I tell her the whole story, and here's her religion again. She goes, oh, I prayed that would happen. And I thought, good for her, bless your soul. Yeah. She wasn't sharing my enthusiasm, because that wasn't her, right? But right. I was, like, ecstatic through the roof. And so, anyway, I went to bed. The next day, the doorbell rings. So this is Shirley, the other sister who I've never met, is going to be at the door. So I'm like, here I've met this one sister like that. Now I've got another sister the next day who I've never met. Both of them I've never, I have no memory of. So that there this girl is standing there with her fo- Caucasian foster mother, white foster mother, this tall woman that looked like a librarian with big glasses. She has passed away since. Um... Standing there with my sister. So they come in the house. And so we're somebody's birthday, and my mom being so gracious and loving, she's always very giving. She's made a party of some sort for us. And so then mom and I start telling the foster mom and Shirley about Marilyn and how I met her the night before. Well, you'd think that lady would be so excited. She wasn't. But somehow, I don't know how it came to be, she's decided to take us downtown Edmonton in her car to meet Marilyn. 
<clears throat> so I remember getting to the executive hotel, right? So you've got Shirley, you've got, now we're going to see the three of us together for the first time. And so we get in the restaurant and we're sitting there and, and sure enough, Marilyn's there. She's a waitress. She's all fixed up with makeup yeah. and hair and waitress outfit. This foster mother takes a huge disliking to Marilyn immediately. Oh, weird. We're there probably 10 minutes, and she's, we got to go. She didn't like her, and we had a very abrupt, short meeting, um, and it was over. So we go back to my foster home, and I get dropped off, and away they go. I have no idea. She judged my sister, Marilyn, and she ended that meeting quickly. And so, yeah, like... <laughs> It was very bizarre. Wow, that's interesting. But in two days, I found two of my siblings. So in the end, it took me 11 years to find all of my siblings. I, you know, as I had a doctor in Calgary. I moved to Calgary to go to art school. And um, I'm at the doctor, and he said, when are you going to start paying your own bills, your medical bills? I said, what are you talking about? I had no idea when you were a foster child at 18, the government stops paying, and you had to start paying your own bills. So I said, <laughs> oh, really? I have to pay my own? I had no idea. So he said, you need to get apply for a medical card. So I went to the office, and while I'm there, this lady whips out this paperwork and all my siblings, except the adopted one, are listed on there where they're living. So I'd met the two sisters, right? So I had a half-brother, Jack. And so I'm like, oh, my God, that's my half-brother, and that's his address. And I don't know what happened, but I said, she had to go to the back room. And I said, can I have a pencil and paper? And this is so weird. She said, don't ever tell anyone what you're writing down from this paperwork. She knew what I was doing. I called him up, and that's how I found him, right? And so long story short, it took me 11 years. I had a full brother I found and a half-sister. So it took me 11 years to find them all, to meet all my First Nations family. I went back. So I had this real crazy idea that I was going to go back to the reserve. And, you know, like being raised in a white Canadian home, I believed there'd be like this white house with a white picket fence, and I was going to find all the, this amazing family. I'm going to be welcomed back in a huge way. Right. And I remember um, I was working for uh, a first, well, an Indian Big Brother program in Calgary at the time. And the lady, like all First Nations people, they always say, oh, where are you from? Who, who, who's your family? Right. And I only knew my mother's maiden name, Little Child. She said, oh, it was Little Child. And she said, oh, well, they're from Hobima. Right? I had no idea where my mother came from, right? Okay, okay. And so then when I, I made a phone call to the, to the band office, and next thing I'm talking to my first cousin, late Richard Littlechild, and so I remember taking, I, I told him who I was, and he said, well, you need to come back and, and come for the weekend. So I remember <laughs> taking the Greyhound from Edmonton. Remember the Greyhound? Yeah, uh, sure. A stinky bathroom, smell oh, like yeah. lemon, gross. Nasty. Anyway, <laughs> I remember getting to the town of Wetaskiwin, and I remember getting off the bus, and I'm like, where's this person? Everybody else got in their cars, somebody picked them up, and like it was like I'm standing there for an hour waiting. And I finally look at this truck, and I see this First Nations guy with braids sitting there. So I go up to the truck and I said, are you Richard? He said, yeah. <laughs> Who knows <laughs> he, he, why he didn't come get me. But anyway, it was just an odd story. And so he takes me back to the reserve and I'm, you know, all excited. You know, he's not talking a whole lot. I want to know everything about my family. And I remember getting to my, his parents' place, my late, the, my late uncle who died of COVID and his wife, my Auntie Rachel, who's still alive. And I remember getting in the house, it, was very, it seemed dark. And so they introduced me to another lady who's there, and that's my mother's sister, Rosalie. And so I'm all excited. I've got, like, I want to ask a million and one questions, you I know. Um, and they didn't talk a lot, you know, and you have to realize there's the culture, uh, the residential school background. There's a lot going on that I have no idea, that I'm living in the white world and I'm coming across as Mr. White Guy with all these questions, and they're just not going to deliver them the way I want the answers to be told to me. Isn't and that beautiful, though? I know. 
It was, it, and it, I mean, years and years, I look at it back now and I go, wow, <laughs> you know, like what I know yeah. now and what I knew then. Um, and it was that day that I learned my mother and father died on Skid Row. Mm. So that's how I found, they told me a bit. And I mean, I, the, the relationship has grown over the years, of course. And I go back to the reserve if I'm in Alberta, I always, and now my uncle's gone. And I think COVID has stripped so many of us that have lost our people, our relatives to COVID. There was no, I couldn't go back to the funeral. I couldn't. And, you know, the last time I saw him was a year before COVID began and he was in the hospital. And I remember him laying in the bed and he woke up and go, I go, hi, uncle. And he, he was so beautiful, the kindest, sweetest. He was this cowboy, you know, like a bit of a redneck in his youth. And he, he was a construction worker. And as he got older, he became the sweetest guy. Mm. And, you know, oh, hi, nephew. <laughs> and I said, oh, I see you're here in the hospital. How are you? You know, and we had a very short conversation. That's the last time I saw him on this earth plane alive. Um, so when I go back to Albert, it's going to seem very strange. They, he's not going to be there. It's really nice that you're, it sounds like you're staying in touch with your family, though. Oh, it is. I mean, I'm still in touch with a lot of the Dutch people. Oh, as well. The Dutch Canadians. I'm in touch yeah. with my white father's family. Okay. So just a bit of history there. My ancestor, Edmund Price, was a baker in New York City. Him and his wife, Jane Webb, she came from New Jersey. And they were pre-loyalists. They were what was called a planter. And they came to New Brunswick in 1767. So my Caucasian side of the family has been in Canada that long. Um, so just in short, you know, so with my mother being who she was and her sweetheart and, and, and really nurturing my art career, and it was her that sent me to art school in Calgary. Um, and I don't even know if the Alberta College of Art knows that I even exist, um, that I even attended their institution because I was using my foster name at the time. Right. And I managed to get through three quarters of the first year and dropped out. So Alberta Art College, I attended your institution without you knowing that I was even there. After that, I went to Red Deer College for two years and got my uh, art and design uh, diploma. And then from there, I went to Nova Scotia College of Art and Design and received my Bachelor of Fine Art degree. And then I went to Banff uh, Center for Independent Studies. I now have a uh, honorary doctorate degree. Um, so I've, yeah, I've done nice. a lot of my where, arts. Where, where, who uh, uh, Fraser Valley you? University. Ah, cool. Yeah. And um, so t can you tell me a little bit about your art? Because I think it's quite fascinating when I when I look at it first off it's so colorful so much color and the other part is that it's um you do a lot of portraits which are quite inter like remember Miss Field for sure Mrs. Field or what I think she was Miss yeah I mean, that was the you know the her influence obviously was that strong yeah, of course. You know, as a child that I would continue doing portraits. So I do a lot of portraits, but if you knew if you knew the breadth of my art career, and I mean, I've been doing this seriously full time for over 30 years. Um, I've also have a lot of work people don't know about. Yeah. And I've done over, you know, over a thousand accomplished paintings, art installations, uh, digital photography, uh, mixed media. Um, so I, I, you know... Yeah, I mean, the portraits seem quite dominant. I should start showing people other works that I've done so they don't just <laughs> think that I'm doing... And everyone thinks I just paint ancestors, which it seems like I do, but not always. And family are a big part of my story, obviously. Yeah. is um, And in your art, I'm wondering about when you are you were saying doing a lot of research... And then you're absorbing that. Are you looking culturally as a, you know, reclaiming some part of your culture? No. So you're every, always trying to explain things with your art? As a child, I realized that someone who was um, perhaps what some would consider an underdog, it's been always my um, mission to help those whose voices were stifled or, or they were controlled or they lost their voice. So as an artist, it's always been my belief to tell the story from a truthful perspective. And I've been doing work around the residential school long before 
any other artists were doing work about the residential school except Joan, late Co- Joan Cardinal Schubert, whose work was an amazing, was, was amazing. She was a wonderful artist, a great mentor. So I've been doing work around these social and political issues ever since I began my art career, right from the go-get, right from the beginning. Um, if you knew the work, and, and sometimes people look at it and go, oh, that's bright and beautiful, or, oh, George is a colorist. But if you knew the history behind all the work that I've done, I mean, I've created installations all about the 60s scoop where I've interviewed other 60s scoop survivors and, and had a room uh, with suitcases and, and children's toys and their text in black, white on black in a black room um, of the stories of these children. And as adults, they tell me these stories and do you want your name? Nobody wanted their name attached to it. Wow. So there's all these stories about 60s scoop survivors yeah and you know you want how many people are we talking about in that about eight okay yeah i when i had my studio in vancouver i had uh i I, i'm an interesting sort i kind of think i had a two-spirited um talking circle once a week and then i had um a 60 scoop survivors talking uh, circle in my, my studio as well okay i offered that because i wanted to heal and i felt Bringing other people like myself together, what a what what a what better way could you you know help heal each other? And it was they were very very powerful uh, situations. So they didn't want to be named. So when you walked in the room, so what people remembered is the car, the knock on the door, the steps of the social worker. So I I had gone and I created this whole loop where you hear a car pulling up. So you're you're looking at the 60s. So I'm used an older car sound. It stops. You hear a car door open. You hear the steps going down the sidewalk. You hear the knock on the door. You hear the door open. You hear a baby cry. You hear the steps going down the sidewalk. The child gets put in the car. Our children, you hear the crying. Uh, the person gets in the car. Uh, the social worker, the door shuts, and they drive off and carry that child away, right, to become part of the 60 scoop. Um so I created that, and it was, and you know, that's that work was shown at the Surrey Art Gallery. It actually traveled in Australia and Tasmania, five different art institutions. It was um, reassembled at a show that I had in St. Albert, Alberta. Um, so I've done work like that, you know. Um, I, I talk about residential school, the reserve system, the 60s scoop. I just finished a huge drawing series of residential school survivors. Well, they're not survivors. They died. Or we don't know if they died. So when I, when I talk about the research, I would go to archives, and I would scour these archives, and I would order photographs, which were sometimes $20 a photograph on an artist's budget, right? And I had stacks of photographs. And what I would do with these photographs, I would go to different um, elders in what was called Hobima, now called Muskwachis, and I would ask them who these people were. And a lot of times they would give me names, and I, I went to about 10 different homes in my research. And so after a while, if, you know, eight people said that's Susan and two people said it was Mary... I deduced that with Susan. They'd often give me their maiden name and married name or who they even married. And I did it with a protocol. You just don't go to somebody and demand. You go in in tradition. um, You offer tobacco. You offer a gift. And I was told what to give. Three yards of fabric with a print on it for the female, uh, a cowboy shirt for the man, and tobacco. Always. You just don't don't show up expecting or demanding. Right, you had to do it in protocol, and I did that, and and so, but there was always children. Nobody knew who they were. Well, who were these children? No one knew them. So I began to realize, and 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 I began to think that I need to do something for these children. So I started drawing from the photographs these children that weren't identified. What happened to them? Were they from another reserve and maybe just ended up going back to their reserves and nobody knew them? But why didn't they know them? Because they were clear about the people. Did they die at the residential school? Right? So I obtained a copy of the registrar 
right, and discharge of the, of the reserve system my mother and her family went to. And you look at the names of the child, their parents' names, how old they were when they arrived at the school, then you look at the discharge. And so some of the drawings in this series are from the discharge papers. So it says the child's name, what grade they achieved, uh, reason for leaving, time out. That meant they were 16. Reason for leaving, sickly. Reason for leaving, um, grandparent came and got them. Reason for leaving, Mary, getting married. And then it kept saying, dead, 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 dead. Then you go to the next page, same thing. Every page had several dead people on, on in these sheets. So I did some of the drawings from that. So it, And then I realized I had two uncles that died there, right? And, you know, so... For me, it's a, it's a way to reclaim, restore, honor, to bring back their voices. And so here's the beauty. The Alberta Art Gallery is going to show that body of work. It will, the show begins in June and will be up for three to four months. Sadly, with COVID, I won't be able to go. So here's this child growing up in Edmonton, Alberta, this foster boy who goes for art classes as a child at the Edmonton Art Gallery and remembering how amazing it was. And they kept one of my drawings from that time. Who knows where it is today? And here I am <laughs> going to be 63. And finally, I will have a solo exhibition in that same institution but in a brand new building and now COVID is going to strip away the fact I can't be there that frustrates me it saddens me but you know what those children will be there and they need to be honored well I got goosebumps as you were saying that I mean COVID or no COVID yeah I'm still goosebumping and that means something I think yeah right yes it does and and so people will be able to visit the exhibition of course they have to um it's like going to see the doctor there's time slots you book a time slot to see the exhibition i also missed a great uh, group show in edmonton at the new first nations art gallery otsitsi one it's a cree word and uh i was part of this because they wanted to honor all the uh, First Nations artists who had their beginning in Edmonton or had a big experience in that city. So I miss that too because of COVID, right? And just so you you know, my work has traveled in many places around the planet, all over the United States, Canada, uh, Australia, Tasmania. I've had a show in Japan. I had a show in Germany, different places. I also have kids' books. I wrote a kids' book. I have a book about my art called The Spirit Giggles Within that I just found out, sold out. So yeah, my career's been huge. And, and I, I will end with this, the idea, this thought. And, you know, I look at my childhood, I look at my life, and there was a lot of trauma. Yeah, sure, there was a lot of trauma. But you know what I always say, my art is my best friend, has has given and provided so much for me, has brought me, given my self-esteem a huge boost. Um, My work has been shown in many places, and and I've I've received so many accolades as a First Nations artist. And and so I always say my, my art is my best friend, has never let me down. It's only added to my life and brought such great things to me as a human being. But as that Indian foster boy, as a First Nations man who was two-spirited, we really didn't talk about being two-spirited, did we? (laughs) Another day. (laughs) Another day. But, you know, I just want to thank you, Zach, for taking this time out, letting me tell my story um, and, and, and the snippets of my life. And I am so thankful to the Creator for the gift he has given me or she um, and, and honoring me that I was born into this life like you, like all people on this planet. We were born to do the things we are meant to do. Sometimes some of us have a hard time finding where we need to be and sometimes people never find it. We're all meant to do something <clears throat> and I know my voice is being heard and still being heard. As long as I'm on the planet, I will fight for First Nations rights. I will fight for First Nations people, Inuit and Métis, because that is what I was born to do. George, I just want to thank you so much for sharing space with me. Thank you for sharing your voice. You're welcome.
George Littlechild is represented by Al Sharinga Gallery in Victoria, BC and Latimer Gallery in Vancouver, BC. You can view his artwork at georgelittlechild.com. He's on Facebook and Instagram and just to Google away from learning all about his latest exhibits. I hope you enjoyed this episode and look forward to connecting with you at the Ranger Cabin on social media. And there you can see some of George's beautiful artwork as well and some of his historical photos that will put a face to some of the stories. Thank you for your kind notes over the past few months. These podcast works are really enjoyable for me to make and I'm looking forward to many, many more. These are tough times, and I hope these stories encourage you to continue lifting up those around you. Be safe. Keep your fire hot. I'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks. Until then, I encourage you to listen to some of the previous episodes. I'm Zach White, and this is The Ranger Cabin. <laughs>